so firstly, I would like to uh, thank Jamie for uh, this great initiation and uh, also thank um, Wan Chun and Jinga for organizing this seminar series. I think it's a it's a very efficient, it's a very important uh, mechanism to have our community connected with each other. Um, so I will try to keep the talk shorter so that we can have more uh, time for questions. Um, so the, the topic for my talk is uh, probably a, a few decades old problem. Uh, it's just about how a receiver should process its received signal for detection. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to um, to introduce a new receiver design. Um, so the talk is mostly based on uh, these two references. Uh, the first paper that was published in 2017 uh, was the original paper that introduces this uh, uh, new receiver design. And then the paper, second paper that is published earlier this year, uh, in which we have obtained a much better understanding on the performance limit, or in generally the performance of uh, our proposed receiver designs. Um, obviously, this is a joint work. Um, uh, it's a co contribution from uh, Wan Chuan, Salman, Petar, Yan Yan, and Wang Hui. And I would like to particularly mention that the original idea of the new receiver design that I'm going to talk about is. Um, is from Wan Chuan. So uh, in that sense, I'm actually very appreciative Wan Chuan for giving me the opportunity to present this work on her behalf, um, which means that if I kind of say anything wrong in the slides, then Wan Chuan can definitely correct me. Um, so, all right, so um, receiver design. Okay, um, just to come back to very basic stuff, right? So it, let's say we have a, a transmitter single antenna transmitter sends a signal X with some power P and it goes through a channel with coefficient H. And then this uh, signal will be received at the, uh, the receiver. Okay. Uh, so are, are you able to see my cursor or? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Um, so um, basically this uh, signal hits the receiving antenna Okay, so that's what uh, we see at the, the receiver side. Now, before the receiver actually can make use of the signal for detection, the receiver has to process the signal somehow, right? So because nowadays we always talk about digital communication. So the receiver needs to process the RF signal somehow to get a digitized sort of signal or a value, can be complex value or, or real value. And this value is then used for detection, okay? So um, now, basically, whatever this part is, is the, the receiver design. I would just call it a receiver design. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to just focus on the very simple scenario where we do not have any fading channel. Therefore, the H is just a fixed constant and known. Uh, in other words, we can set H to be, uh, to be one, right? So we can ignore that, all right? Uh, and also, uh, little things is that uh, this, X here is just a baseband uh, representation. So here, although we are having an RF signal, I'm just still using the baseband equivalent notation to make sure there's no confusion. All right, so uh, what are the receiver designs that we have used for, for ages, right? So this one is prob probably everyone knows this one. It's a coherent receiver uh, by coherent what I basically mean is that when uh, the receiver gets the RF signal, that's the antenna, right? So it gets the RF signal. And then we just do RF to baseband conversion uh, with both the I and Q, the in-phase and quadrature. After that, we are going to use analog to digital converter so that we can get a digitized value, right? Um, so the Y1 here is basically um, a digitized value that uh, include information of both the in-phase and the quadrature of the original signal. In other words, it's, uh, it has information about the amplitude and the phase of the transmitted signal. Uh, now, these are just uh, two noise component. This one is the antenna noise. Um, this one is the processing noise because any processing uh, for the down conversion will also introduce some noise. So that's just the processing noise. Um, so it's commonly called the coherent 
processing or coherent detection because it uses both the amplitude and phase information. Okay. Yeah, I hope this is basically a sort of everyone knows about this receiver. Um, so I don't have to spend too much time on that. Um, the other, I would say, commonly used receiver architecture is this power detection receiver. Um, so we have the RF signal collected, which goes into a power detection circuit. Now, there are um, a number of ways we can implement a power detection circuit. Here, I'm just uh, sort of uh, use one of the way to illustrate, which is that this RF signal will be rectified by, by a rectifying circuit, and which means this high frequency RF sort of sinusoidal, uh, sinusoidal signal will be converted into roughly a DC current. And then this DC current will be uh, digitized. In other words, we want to get a value out of this DC current. The, then you have this uh, Y2, right? So the Y2 basically um, is, uh, is a real value, if you like. So, um, so the power detection cir circuit is usually used when the modulation scheme is like pulse amplitude modulation, right? So if we use pulse amplitude modulation, only the amplitude carries information, not the phase, right? So then we don't really need to worry about the phase. Uh, uh, one thing I want to also mention is that this output signal Y2 is proportional to the instantaneous power of the transmit signal. Or in other words, it's the amplitude square of the transmit signal. And that is also the reason why it's called the power detection circuit. Um, so, so um, yeah, I think um, this receiver design is, uh, is not new, right? It's also commonly used. Now, people studying this receiver have also compared what is the achievable rate that we can obtain from this compared with the achievable rate that uh, we usually obtained from this coherent receiver. Um, the overall result is as follows. Like in two people, which says that the achievable rate of the coherent detection receiver is higher than the achievable rate of this power detection circuit. Intuitively, that makes sense because power detection only uses the amplitude or amplitude square, but not the phase, right? So, uh, but the, the difference between these achievable rates highly depends on the relative strengths of the antenna noise and the processing noise. Okay, so that's one thing that people have found. Okay, so this, this, is, this is basically what uh, people have already found, right? Now, what's new, right? So this is the new receiver design. Um, we call it splitting receiver. Now you can see that this part is still the coherent detec detection, right? And this part is, again, the same as the power detection, right? So these two parts are the same, right? But we're using these two ways jointly. How to use that jointly? So you can see here we have the RF signal and we're using a power splitter. In other words, we're splitting the, the received signal into two branches. One branch is processed by the coherent processing. The other branch is processed by this power detection based processing. Okay. And the splitter can be characterized by the ratio um, rho. That's the splitting ratio. It determines how what's the proportion of the signal that has been split into the first branch and also what is the remaining have been split into the second branch. Uh, one thing that is important to, to note is that here we have Y1 and Y2. We are going to both uh, use both Y1 and Y2 to make a joint detection, right? So we are going to make a decision based on these two values together, not individually, right? Um, so this is, you can see that this is basically a, a simple uh, alteration or simple change in the receiver architecture uh, by using this power splitter. And that's the reason why we call it a splitting receiver. Um, now, once a new receiver is proposed, obviously we need to study its performance. Uh, so to study its performance, firstly, uh, let's put some simple uh, assumptions. So I'm going to assume that the antenna noise and also these two processing noises, they are independent and they all follow Gaussian distribution with different variants. And, and of course, this is a simplification. 
But typically, these are the assumptions used in the literature of uh, coherent detection and power, de power detection receiver anyway. Okay. Now, to study the performance of this uh, splitting receiver, uh, typically we can look at two things. One is the maximum achievable rate, uh, which we, we have to use mutual information to study that. Uh, the second one is, okay, if we are using this receiver to do detection of, say, a given modulation scheme, then we can study what is the symbol error rate and bit error rate, okay? So in the following, I'm going to talk about both of them. Uh, uh, this signal model, I think that's important to, to discuss now. Uh, you can see that the Y1 is basically uh, the first branch. So you can see that this is the receive signal with the noise, receive signal with the antenna noise, and it has a splitting ratio of rho, but because this is the power ratio, therefore, in terms of signal or amplitude, it has to be square root of rho. And then you have this uh, processing noise added. Now for the second branch, because it's a power detection circuit, as I said, Y2 is proportional to the amplitude square. So that's why you can see here is an amplitude square. And then you have the processing noise. Okay. Anyway, uh, as I said, firstly, we want to look at the, um, the mutual information, which means what is the mutual information between the transmit signal and the receive signal, which would be Y1 and Y2. Now, to study the mutual information, we need to put assumptions on what is the distribution of X. In other words, what, what's the distribution of the input to the channel? Uh, it's, in general, a difficult question uh, if we really want to know what is the optimal distribution, because uh, it's, it's unknown. Um, therefore, we assume X follows a Gaussian distribution. Um, now, with that assumption, uh, we can derive the mutual information between the transit signal and the receive signals of that receiver design. Um, now, the exact, uh, exact mutual information expression can be calculated numerically by using quite a few integrals uh, because we all know the, the probability distributions. Uh, so this is just approximation here I presented. Um, this is actually a reasonably accurate approximation um, that works. Um, so, so anyway, so we are able to um, compute the achievable mutual information for the splitting receiver. Now, what's the next question? Well, the next question would be, okay, we know this is the performance of the splitting receiver, but we want to know whether the splitting receiver performs better than the coherent receiver or not, because that coherent receiver is the state of the art, right? So we want to know whether the splitting receiver is better or worse. Uh, to do that, we need to compare this mutual information with of the splitting receiver with the mutual information achieved by simply the coherent receiver. Now that's very easy, right? So that's just log one plus SNR, right? So that's signal to noise ratio here. So this is a known result uh, uh, that this is just the, the, the maximum mutual information achievable by the coherent receiver. So we can use this as the benchmark and compare what we, have what we can achieve with the splitting receiver with this value. Uh, to quantify the performance difference, we have defined two metrics. The first metric is basically the absolute difference between the mutual information achieved by the splitting receiver and the mutual information achieved by this, co this conventional coherent receiver. So that's the absolute difference between uh, these two receivers. The second metric is just the percentage difference. Okay, so what is the absolute difference? The other is percentage difference. Um, so results. So firstly, we can look at the results when SNR is extremely high. Uh, in other words, we let the transmit power goes to infinity. Uh, in this case, we can see that the absolute difference is a constant. It's not depending on the, 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 the transmit power anymore. So it's a constant. So in other words, at a really, really high SNR, uh, splitting receiver gives a larger mutual information than the, co the, and then a conventional coherent receiver. And this gap is a constant. 
It's given by this equation. And you can see that this guy heavily depends on the relative strength of the antenna noise power and the processing noise power. So these two, uh, one is antenna noise power, the other is the processing noise power. So the relative strength of these noise powers matters. Now, the percentage difference is obviously zero because at high SNR, if we achieve a constant gain, and you know that in the high SNR, uh, mutual information tends to infinity, right? So the constant gain over infinity is zero. So that's why the percentage improvement. Okay. So, uh, so that, this is the result when we look at really, really high SNR. Now, of course, uh, we usually work with practical SNR values. So uh, what we do is we can also look at what would be the performance with, at, at practical SNR values. So here, this uh, is a plot of mutual information at different SNRs. So one curve is at one SNR. Now, the x-axis is just the splitting ratio. Remember that rho is the ratio controlling how much, what is the proportion of power splitted, oh, sorry, what's the proportion of the signal splitted into the first branch and what's the proportion of the received signal splitted into the second branch. Um, so you can see that we just take one uh, curve. You can see that, well, the optimal splitting ratio for the top curve is around 0.8 and the achievable mutual information is uh, higher than 11 uh, bits per, per symbol. Um, now, we can also compare it with when rho is one. So what does rho equal to one mean? Rho equal to one means the receiver is simply a coherent receiver. So if we have coherent receiver, this is the achievable mutual information. You can see that there is a, a significant improvement in the mutual information. One, uh, the, the optimal one is above 11, and the coherent receiver only gives us lower than 10, right? So there is uh, at least 10% uh, or 15% improvement. Okay, so, um, so this is basically uh, the results about uh, the performance comparison in terms of mutual information or the data rate uh, between the splitting receiver and the coherent receiver. Um, I'm not going to, uh, oh yeah, the other thing I want to mention is that if you look at the optimal row, optimal splitting ratio, uh, the optimal splitting ratio increases when the SNR increases. Okay, so that's another, uh, another results that we have seen. Okay, uh, I, I don't think I want to go through this table too much, but uh, uh, the idea is that because uh, here at the highest SNR, when P goes to infinity, we have said that the percentage of performance improvement is zero. Uh, this is actually a very bad result for us. Uh, but what we want to know is if P is finite, in other words, at finite SNR, what would be those like representative um, percentage improvements? So, um, so in this table, I just want to just focus on, don't worry about this. I just want to focus on these parts, right? So you can see that this is the percentage improvement. Therefore, these values are the percentage improvement at different SNR values or different value of P. You can see that when P is small with certain noise conditions, we can see that the performance improvement can be still very large, right? You can see the 44%, uh, 31%, 24%, and uh, 20%. So this 20%, performance improvement is even observable when the transmit power is set to 10 to the 5, right? So which is still very high. So you can see that although analytically we have said when P goes to infinity, uh, the, the, the percentage improvement is zero, but that is not a very indicated um, a result. In at a practical SNR, we see that the performance improvement can still be very high. All right, so that's basically about the data rate. Now, what about things like, okay, if we use a 64 QAM to transmit, what is the symbol error rate? Right. So here we plot the symbol error rate versus the row value. Again, when row equals one, we are talking about the conventional coherent receiver. So each curve is, a, is at a different uh, SNR. 
right? So it doesn't really matter which curve you look at. For example, if you look at the third curve, right? Now you can see that if we use the coherent receiver, then the SER, the symbol error rate is at this value. But if we use the splitting receiver with the optimal splitting ratio of 0.9, you can see that the symbol error rate can be uh, much lower. It's not too much lower, but still significantly lower. So this again uh, verifies that the splitting receiver has the potential to, uh, to give us significant performance improvement from the uh, coherent receiver. All right, so I think that's basically what I want to cover. Um, so I just want to conclude by saying that this idea of splitting receiver is, I would say, a very simple redesign, but it's a very simple redesign at a very fundamental building block of a communication system, uh, which means there's a lot of open problems uh, or research opportunities for a lot of people, because I believe that this idea still haven't been sort of picked up by other people. Uh, it's still within our research sort of group and, and networks that know about this uh, new receiver design. So there will be uh, many uh, research problems that are open and, and waiting for us to solve. And we are working on some of these dot points that I have listed here. Um, so as I said, this talk is based on these two papers. And if anyone finds this idea interesting, I would encourage you to read these two papers because these are the only two papers that you need to read to understand uh, this literature. Um, and this is a very new um, area. Therefore, I would like to uh, welcome all questions, comments, and even criticisms about this work so that this will all help us to uh, do our future research. All right, thanks.